Amen. Well, if you have got a Bible, why don't you open up to John chapter 20 or on your phone. We've been in a series in John's Gospel, um, as many of you know, going through the upper room. So we're going to finish out this morning that series in uh, this uh, chapter this morning, John chapter 20. I'm going to start by reading it. Um, and I suppose as I read it, you know, this is like one of the most incredible pieces of literature that has ever been written, this chapter of the Bible. The effect that it has had, along with the other eyewitness accounts, but the effect that this has had on history is monumental. It is the reason, these eyewitness accounts are the reason that we are sat here today, the reason our society looks like it does, the reason that billions of lives around the world have been changed and the direction of them set. This is everything. And so here we go, we're going to read it, and as I read it, you might like to close your eyes or just imagine, and you might have heard these words many times, but just cast your mind back and imagine what was it like on that day, what was the reactions, the smells, the taste, the sounds, and just picture it in your mind's eye for a moment. So early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple and the one Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple uh, started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking she was, he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, he was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him and said, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I've seen the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I I, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God, And Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Hallelujah. This is, as I said, one of the most important things that has ever been written. 
And John himself was a poet and a philosopher. His gospel's probably my favorite, if you're allowed favorites. He writes it sometime after the other ones have been written, which means he probably knew how important this was going to be when he wrote it, because he was one of maybe the last few people that would have ever and ever been able to have actually written these things down, having seen them. Which is why I think, I don't know if you noticed this, but it is quite surprising the way in which he opens this account. I don't know if you've ever noticed this detail. I just think it's kind of hilarious. But it says, early on in the tomb, whilst it was still dark, um, sorry, so scroll down a few verses. Verse 3. So Peter and the other disciple, that's John, Peter and the other disciple started towards the tomb. Both were running, it says, both were running, but the other disciple, that's John, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. <laughs> Is that not just really, really funny? You know, if you think about the overly competitive attitude that you've seen here this morning, you're wondering what the tender, tenuous link is to the resurrection. Well, there it is. That competitive spirit, we find it here in the Gospels. And what's really funny is that you just keep reading it and, and John just, he, like, he just keeps going. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent in over and looked at the strips of the linen there but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him <laughs> and, went straight, and they went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of, uh, of linen lying there as well as the cloths um, in Jesus' place. And then verse 8, finally, <laughs> the other disciple who'd reached the tomb first also went inside. At last, Peter, you're so slow. It's like he doesn't make the point once, but three times he has to mention that he reached the tomb first. It's just hilarious. And then the funny thing is, is then like later on, isn't it? If you notice this at the end of the uh, chapter, uh, sort of um, verse, verse 30 and 31, John says, basically, there were many other things that Jesus said and did, but I didn't have space to include them in my gospel account, which means there are things that Jesus said and did that we don't know about because John instead decided to tell us that he was a faster runner than Peter. <laughs> And I wonder what Peter's reaction was. You imagine them on the phone chatting about this. John's like, Peter, what did you think of my gospel? And he's like, I didn't even know we were having a race. I can't believe you included, like, what is he thinking, including this detail in his, you know, it's just crazy, isn't it? But what I love about it is the fact that this shows that, that the earliest witnesses were, were just like us. They were human beings just like us. Some of them were overly competitive <laughs> just like us this morning and you know it's kind of beautiful isn't it that that is the case and um, I kind of wonder why you know I mean some people have made the point well John's trying to demonstrate that you know he didn't go into the tomb alone that he was with Peter and I'm sure that's part of it but he didn't have to make quite such a big deal of it as he does and and what's going on there I mean Peter and John would have known each other for a long long time prior to have met meeting Jesus and they were both fishermen was there something of a, a competitive spirit between them is it just a bit of banter that John includes because he thinks it's really funny or or is there something that's deeper going on there does John have his own kind of insecurities and his sense of you know I don't know low self-esteem that means he he somehow it doesn't even realize what he's doing as he's writing it but he's always trying to make sure he's putting himself as, as one up above Peter somehow in in conversation and that kind of comes out as he's writing we, you know truth is we don't we don't know but all of those things are very human and very like us are they not and then as you know it gets me thinking about who are the other characters in this in this account that are there, there's obviously Mary Magdalene. She's there. She's the first at the tomb. She's the first to see the risen Lord Jesus as well. She, in some senses, is the primary witness to the resurrection. Now, uh, church tradition says that she was a single woman. And, and we don't know much else about her, really, other than she was one of Jesus' earliest followers. She was delivered from uh, a, an evil spirit. Uh, she was most likely living on her own. Now, as a woman in the first century, your status in society was inherently tied to the person you were married to. If you were married to a man of high status, then you had status. If you weren't, then you weren't. And if you were single, then you had basically no legal standing in society, no social security, probably very little in a way of income. Come. Your testimony was not to be believed over a man's, which means you're incredibly vulnerable to exploitation, sexual exploitation and abuse. And so this woman, Mary, we don't know everything that she has gone through, but chances are it's a lot. She's someone who's experienced an incredible amount of prejudice 
we can say that for sure, but she was also someone who's likely to have been abused, perhaps treated incredibly badly. She's a very human person. There are some of you sat here this morning who have experienced that, who maybe have experienced prejudice because of your gender, because of the color of your skin, because of your class, because of the background of which you've come from. There's some of you who are incredibly vulnerable, some of you who have in all sorts of ways been abused and mistreated. And here she is. She's there as well. Who else do we have? We have the disciples who are in the room, the locked room that Jesus walks into. They're there because they're afraid and they're fearful. The early disciples, the first witnesses of the resurrection, were just like us, afraid. And then you have Thomas. Thomas, who wasn't there when Jesus appeared, and despite all of his friends telling him, this is what happened literally a couple of days ago, he says, I cannot believe unless I see the scars in his hands, unless I see the scars in his side, otherwise I'm not going to believe that it's Jesus. His doubts. Thomas doubts. Maybe there's some of you here this morning that are full of doubts. You know, the early disciples, those first witnesses of the resurrection, were people just like us. And I think this is significant, that actually as we come to this resurrection story, we're all coming to it with a degree of carrying our own brokenness and stuff that's going on inside of us. And some of us, like John, have maybe got insecurities about our athletic ability. Some of us have got, you know, that sense of prejudice or abuse or vulnerability like Mary. Some of us have got doubts like Thomas. Some of us have got fears like those other early disciples. And this is the way in which all of us come to and approach this day, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And it's significant for you because the trouble is all of that brokenness and difficulty can speak a different story to you that can do something to you. I just want to read you this because I think it's a great example of of what this looks like so many of you will know Matthew Perry who sadly died not too long ago uh, best known as Chandler Bing in Friends and um, he writes about in his autobiography about a time when he was dating Julia Andrews and the way that it happened was that uh, she had been asked to star on the show she said uh, I will only star on the show if I can feature in Chandler Bing's storyline. Amazing. So he, he finds this out and he sends her three dozen roses and a card um, and the card read, the only thing more exciting than the prospect of you doing this show is that I finally have an excuse to send you flowers. She responds by sending him loads of bagels. She obviously knew the way to a man's heart. So that's what she did. And then uh, they had a, a three month, they were going out for basically three months And he said, three or four times a day, I would sit by my fax machine and watch the piece of paper, slowly revealing her next message. Uh, I was so excited that some nights I would find myself out at some party, sharing a flirtatious exchange with an attractive woman, only to cut the conversation short so I could race home and see if a new fax had arrived. Nine times out of ten, one had. And after a few months, they they were dating each other. But then he went on to say this. He said, dating Julia Roberts had been too much for me. I'd const- I was constantly certain that she was going to break up with me. Why would she not? I was not enough. I could never be enough. I was broken. I was bent. I was unlovable. Instead of facing the inevitable agony of losing her, I broke up with the beautiful and brilliant Julia Roberts. Because he couldn't imagine a future past his own brokenness. Just like Mary, he was vulnerable. Just like Thomas, he doubted. Just like the disciples, he was fearful. Maybe just like John, he has his own insecurities about who he was as a person and he let that story begin to be the story that defined him and in truth it robbed his future. And I want to say to you here this morning that you need to know that the resurrection means that your own insecurities, your own failures, your own weaknesses, your own vulnerabilities, the things that have happened to you are not able this morning to rob your future from you because Jesus Christ has created a new future for you this morning in his resurrection. That is what he has done, which means you do not have to be defined by the person that you were, but by the person that you are becoming in him. There is, 
I think sometimes a mistake that we make when someone says to you, you know, I want to tell you what the gospel is, or you ask a, a follower of Jesus, tell me what the gospel is, and they'll often tell you something like this, that you are sinful and fallen and broken, but God has forgiven you so that you can come back to him. And that's in essence what many people describe as being the gospel. I want to tell you this morning, that is not it. That is not what the gospel is. It's a part of the picture, an important one. We believe that on Good Friday, the slate is wiped clean and you are forgiven and there there is a way to come forward. But for many people, that is where they stop. And yes, there is forgiveness. Yes, there is mercy. But there is also grace and new life. It's really important that you don't get stuck living on Easter Saturday, Holy Saturday, but you understand that in your life there is also an Easter Sunday. There is a resurrection. You don't just end at that point of forgiveness, but you move forward from that into new life. The gospel of just forgiveness is not enough because there is grace that is poured out and poured out and poured out for you. I want you to hear that and understand that this morning and start to imagine a better story for your life. That not only does he want to forgive you, but he wants to move you into that space where your wildest dreams come true. You know, someone told me it was like this once, that when you're gardening, it's not just enough to pull up all of the weeds. Because if you just pull up the weeds and you leave bare soil, the weeds grow back. You have to plant flowers as well. And like that's what the Lord wants to do in your life, is not just pull up the weeds, but actually begin to plant new things and new life. One of the things that I, I find incredible about this particular account of, of, well, all the accounts of Jesus' resurrection, is that he appears with holes in his hands, scars in his hands and scars in his side. Has that not ever seemed a bit strange to you? You know, because, you know, Paul goes on to talk about Jesus' resurrection body as the first fruits of the, of the new creation. That place where we believe in Revelation 21, that there is no more mourning nor crying or pain. The old things have fallen away and the new things are coming. And it's like on that final day, the blind will see and the deaf will hear and those in wheelchairs will walk and all of illness and all of pain and all of mourning will fade away. And, and Jesus' resurrected body is like the first fruits of that beginning to appear. So then, why is it that he's got scars in his hands? Like, surely, if he was to be perfected, he would be scar-free. And I think the reason is, is that because the scars in his body tell something of the glory of what is being created. That actually what God does in bringing about that new story into your life is to take what is broken and to redeem it and to restore it in such a way that the scars of the things that you have been through, the things that you have experienced, begin to tell the story of the glory of what God is doing in your life. I've got this picture to show. There was an artist I I came across recently called um, Rob uh, Strath straight I think and um, I don't know if we've got this image on, on the screen Thomas if you can find it he, he basically he was uh, helping his wife clear out his mother-in-law's house after she passed away he dropped a plate on the floor and it smashed and then he didn't know what to do with it he left it on the side uh, of the kitchen for months and then eventually he had this inspiration to, to basically mount it on a canvas and then out of the broken pieces begin to draw something that came out of it and, and he said this, he said what he was doing in that process was finding ways to tell stories beyond the broken pieces. And this is what the Lord wants to do in your life. We've got a few more pictures of this. There's another one here. And, I, you know, I love the way that, like the form of it, that it's like where there are cracks and where there is brokenness, there's just like out of that space, life just flows out of it. You know, like the scars on Jesus' hands, where there, are, where there is cracks and brokenness, there's just life just explodes out of it. There's a, a third one as well. There's a whole series of these. You can find them on Instagram. There it is. You know, in, in this one, it looks like it's just pouring out, out of the brokenness and out of the cracks. Life just begins to pour out. I want you to know this this morning, that this is a picture for you to know today, that there is brokenness in your life. Like Mary, maybe you're someone who's experienced abuse and prejudice. Like John, maybe you struggle with a sense of inadequacy. Maybe like the disciples, you're afraid. Maybe like Thomas, you doubt. 
But all of those things are things that the Lord can begin to use to tell a better story and a new story in your life. You know, one of the reasons that we are sat here today is because Mary was there as the first witness of the resurrection. And at the time, that was very inconvenient because uh, it's, it's been widely shared lots of times, but a woman's testimony was not re- seen as reliable evidence in court. And in fact, if you were making up this story, you'd obviously want a man to be the first witness, pre- preferably a, an elite man of high social status to be the first witness to the resurrection because that would make it seem much more valid in the time in which it was written. And it must have been tempting for them at the time as they were retelling the story to edit it slightly and tell it differently because it would have been easier to believe. Which is why now we look back and we think there is something that has the earmark of genuine eyewitness testimony about this because you wouldn't write it like this unless that had been the way that it had happened. And so isn't it incredible that today we look at Mary and her part of this story And we see that as one of the reasons why this story is valid and true. And the reason we think that is because of all of the prejudice and all of the pain and all of the hurt and all of the heartache and all of the abuse that Mary experienced in her life. And out of the pain of her brokenness and her failure and her sin and her difficulty, we see with eyes to see what Jesus really did. So do you see she's just like that broken plate? Out of her brokenness pours this story that makes the validity of what we are reading this morning true. God takes the broken pieces and out of it writes a better story. As we read this resurrection account, we're not just reading about what actually happened, but we're also seeing these very characters themselves being resurrected. As God brings a story out of Mary's brokenness and Thomas's doubts and John's competitiveness, which is maybe by what drove him to write it down in the first place, we don't know. But he's able of redeeming what is broken about you and using it for a brighter future. I want you to know that this morning, that you know we identify with this account, we see it, we understand that it's almost like we could imagine that we were here. You are not just forgiven, you are invited to new life. I don't know if there's like a, a calling that God has put up on you or something that you have just been dreaming of for a long time and you've just felt, you know, I'm just not worthy of this. I don't think I can do it. Don't listen to yourself. I feel like I've had many a meeting with someone who said, I thought about baptism, but I just don't feel like I'm worthy. Or someone said, it took me years before I decided I could become a church member because I just didn't feel worthy of it. I didn't feel like walking through these doors because I just didn't feel like I was enough. And do you know the thing that I say in those conversations with people? Don't be such an idiot. (laughs) I say it kind of sensitively, but... (laughs) The truth is most people know that already. You know, because it takes a little time to internalise, doesn't it? What you've... You know this to be true, but it has to sink to the bottom of your heart and so we're just going to have a moment now to allow that to begin to settle over you that you might have that insecurity of we'll have the band back up of insecurity feeling you know I don't feel worthy enough for the Lord don't feel worthy enough for this calling maybe you're thinking of coming to faith or getting baptized or there's something else that God is calling you into in in your life don't be such an idiot if he can take the broken pieces of the lives that we've read about and use them to tell the most incredible piece of literature in all of history that we are still reading today. He's more than capable of using you. So we're going to have the team bring around communion. We're going to take communion together now um, as, a, as a church. But the thing about communion is that I think sometimes we think of communion as we take these elements of the of the bread, bread and the wine, think of them obviously literally as the, they are like representations of the body and the blood of Jesus. And we think of the blood that covers all of our sin and we confess to the Lord in communion our sin and we expect that he will forgive us and he, and he will. But of course it is much, much more than that. That as you take communion in this moment, you are in some senses consuming the body and blood of Christ 
that his resurrection life is entering into you. Obviously, it's not what's happening in the moment, but it's representational that as you take this communion, it's his resurrection life entering into you. You notice what Jesus did when he was in that room with his disciples. It says he breathes on them, which is a weird thing to do, isn't it? But he's, he's saying, receive my Holy Spirit. Receive my life. And this is what's going to make you worthy of the calling of which I've put upon you. Worthy to step into everything that I'm asking you and calling you to be. So the band are going to begin to play a song as the communion elements come out and then in a moment we'll take them all together. But I just want you in this moment to just spend time before the Lord confessing but also really important to just be receiving. Of going, you know God, I, I hear that you want to pour life into me today. That you want to resurrect me. And I in many ways, like those early disciples, don't feel worthy and I have my doubts and my insecurities, but Lord, I just want to receive from you today and know that you are enough and that you are worthy. So we'll just sit for a moment whilst these guys bring this round and the band play. I'll come back in a moment. <laughs> 